Part of your assignment was not career opportunities, but did any of y'all read that? It's on page 12. It started with um, the orientation of cosmetology, and I'm not going to go deep into that, but most of the time when I get new students, what they want to do is go to work in a beauty salon or own their own beauty salon. How many of y'all are like that? And most of them do not realize how much else is out there. And there's nothing wrong with being a shop owner or working in a beauty salon. Not one thing wrong with it. As a matter of fact, you've got to start there before you go any further. But just with your master license and your education here, there's so many other things you can do. And the first thing it lists is salon stylist. Next is a hair color specialist. As long as you stay in this rural area, you're not going to make it as a specialist because you've got to do a little bit of all of it to have your customers but even as close as Macon, Augusta, and Savannah, when you go into a salon, one person may color your hair. One person would do the perm or the relaxer on it. Some of them in there just do wigs and extensions and don't do anything else. Some of them just sell retail products. Some of them are skin care specialists or esthetician. Some of them just do facial makeup. Some of them just do nails. Some of them have become a day spa stylist or technician. Some, after a while, are tired of working in the field actively. It's hard work and become a salon manager or a salon owner. And then we go into some things that's a little more interesting, such as a product educator. Who better to go into the salons in school and sell those products to the instructors or the salon owners than a cosmetologist that has been trained on these products. You know, tell them how wonderful this is. Of course, you want to be honest always, but a product educator. And we're going to have one of those in this quarter. And a product educator, what they'll do is come and they'll show us how to use that product. They'll tell us what's in that product, what we can expect from that product, how it works best, the things we can do with it that will make it not work to maximum. And... Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you, product educators get paid really well. Usually they make from 250 to $350 a day plus their travel expenses. And these product educators are people just like us, and a lot of them own their salons and um, work in the salon and do this on Sundays and Mondays. You may become a cosmetic chemist. And a chemist is one who works with products and changes the formulations of them or even develops new products. And who better than you to do that? You know you've given this perm and it has a tendency to dry hair out, so you can come in and recommend that they put certain products in it to help it soften the hair more and yet still do what you want it to do. A session stylist is a, ses is a stylist that works to style hair and makeup for models that are being photographed. Also, you may aspire to be a hairstylist for TV, movies, or theaters. A style or artistic director, a design team member, or a platform artist. And a platform artist is often who we go to see when we go to a beauty show. They're going to show us the new techniques, what's going on, something new they've learned to do in cutting or styling or whatever. You might want to be a competition champion. And you may even want to one day become an educator. Also a writer. Often I get the question, why do we have to take English 101? Well, who do you think writes the articles in our beauty magazines? A writer? What can they write about cosmetology and the things that occur with it? So who writes the articles? the cosmetologist. A lot of them do it freelance and just sell it to the um, magazines. Could you stand a little of that? Yeah, because it's something you do on the side. Who's experiencing the things with these products and these customers? You are. You may also become a state board member. So now you know there's a lot of things you can shoot for once your goal is reached of graduating from school, passing your state board. There's some other things you may want to set your goal on. What we were supposed to go over today is life skills. 
And everybody needs life skills, and some of these are a little unique to cosmetology, but most of them are just unique to human beings. So there are a great many life skills that lead to more satisfying and productive existence. Some of the most important for us are that we're being genuinely caring and helpful to other people. Remember what we said Friday? We're in personal services business. Successfully adapting to different situations. You're going to go from a 65 or 75-year-old lady to a 14-year-old child in just that short a period of time. And you've got to adapt to them. You don't expect them to adapt to you. Sticking to a goal and seeing a job to completion. Developing a deep reservoir of common sense. Making good friends and feeling good about yourself. Maintaining a cooperative attitude in all situations. Defining courage for yourself and living courageously within your definition. Approaching all of your work and personal matters with a strong sense of responsibility. Everything that goes on in the salon where you work is your responsibility, even if you're not the only one working there. It's our responsibility to make sure the salon gets a good name, even if we're not the owner. So we've got to learn to take responsibility for a lot of things. Learning techniques that will help you become more organized, having a sense of humor to bring you through difficult situations. And as rewarding as cosmetology is, you are going to get into difficult situations. People sometimes have a tendency to be difficult. And you've got to learn to handle it. Acquiring that great virtue known as patience. And those difficult individuals try that patience, I assure you. Consistently making an effort in all projects you undertake and always striving for excellence. And dedicating yourself to becoming an honest and trustworthy individual. Many people believe that when they attain success, all their problems will be solved. Success often comes with its own set of problems. The best solution to these problems is to have a sturdy set of life skills in place. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the psychology of success. Will success make you happy? It can. It can. But that's not a set rule, is it? When I ask, does it make you happy? It can. But that, you did not answer me yes. Sometimes success makes people unhappy. Why would that be the case? Stress from it. So what we want to do is have some guidelines for success. A lot of people think they can't be a success, and even after they become a success, they don't realize that that's what they are. That can become a problem, too. So some of the guidelines for success, the best thing is to build self-esteem. Why is self-esteem important to success? You're only going to go so far as you feel like you can go. If you don't have the self-esteem to step forward and tackle this thing, then you're not going to have a success. And once you get a success, most people, it will make them feel better and have a little higher self-esteem. And therefore, they can accomplish more goals. But a lot of people are not satisfied with that success. They think for some reason it just fell out of the sky on top of them. They didn't do anything to make them themselves feel worthy about to visualize and when we talk about visualizing picture yourself on a screen as a person of conf confidence competence and maturity why is it important that we visualize give you a sense of where you're going see yourself in this nice beauty salon Oh, the equipment is so nice, and it's full of customers and all kind of stuff. If you don't see yourself there, you may not get there, had you? Build on your strengths. Most of us deep down know what our strengths are. Most of us know what our weaknesses are. And a lot of people don't realize that you're already strong here. Why should you build on it? Because that's what you've got to depend to step on to get your weakness is up to par. Practice doing whatever it is that helps you maintain a positive self-image. 
When you're good at something, take some time every day to do that one thing because it makes you feel good. Be kind to yourself. So far we've talked about this is a personal service industry and we can only think about the other fella, our customers mainly. But at the end of the day, if we leave them and go home to a house full of drudgery and we don't do nothing but mop and cook and do the laundry and put the kids to bed and all this and we don't take any time for ourselves, we're not going to be a success then. Why? We're tired. We're going to be miserable. We're going to be unhappy. And what's the point? If this is all we're getting out of life, what is the point? You know, so we've got to be kind to ourselves. Put a stop to self-critical and negative thoughts. The unfortunate truth is there are a lot of people in the world who are ready to be rude and insensitive. You do not have to be rude and insensitive to yourself. If you make a mistake, tell yourself that it's okay. You'll do better next time. And define success for yourself. Each one of you should look at success as a different thing. All of you shouldn't have the very same goal. And you might think, well, all of us should have the goal of passing cosmetology and taking our state board. But that's not necessarily success for each one of you. That should be a goal maybe right now. What is success to you? What does success mean? Make an A. Make an A? To me right now, if I were in your shoes, um, I'd be satisfied to pass this test. That gives me one success, doesn't it? Then I can go on to something else. Don't worry about what other people call success to you. All the time I get this story. I've been at such and such a school taking the things my mom and daddy wanted me to take, and I've always wanted to do hair. And I was so unhappy. So success to your mom and daddy was you becoming a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief, or whatever. Your definition of success was to be in the cosmetology. So always make sure you have your own definition of success. Practice new behaviors. Creating success is a skill. You can help to develop it by practicing other new behaviors such as speaking with confidence. Stand tall. Use good grammar when you speak and sounding proud when you list your achievements. When I ask a question, answer. That's part of practicing this new behavior. Quit sitting back in class and letting everybody else participate while you sit there wanting to participate. Keep your personal life separate from your work. Why is that important? It does cause confusions. And why does it cause confusions? Um, because uh, if you bring your personal life instead of flying, it can uh, offend others and flying your clients and everything. It may offend other people. And how many people really want to know about your personal life unless they're the type of person that's interested in just gossip all the time? And then do we really want to tell them our personal life? You should have friends that you can talk to about your personal life, but it shouldn't be at work shouldn't be at school. And I used to tell my youngest son this, and he said he didn't understand it. In just the last few years, he's got to where he understands it. Familiarity breeds contempt. And the more you tell people about yourself, after a while, when you do something to irritate them, they're going to throw it back up in your face just like you were an awful person. So you don't let them get to be too familiar with you. Keep it at home. The book tells us to learn to, to compartmentalize. And I told this tale, and I tell it to every class I come through once I had heard it or read it. Um, leave your troubles outside the door. And they tell about this man that worked at this plant, and nobody at the plant really knew a whole lot about him because he never talked about his personal life. When he was at work, he was nothing but at work. And one day he went out to the parking lot and his car wouldn't crank and his supervisor happened to be out there and he asked him, said, would you like for me to take you home? And the employee told him, said, I, I would really appreciate that. So all the way home, they didn't talk about anything. But when they got to the man's house, the man asked him, said, would you like to get out and meet my family? And naturally, the supervisor really did. He didn't even know if he had a family. He didn't know anything about him. So he got out and 
As they got out of the car, the employee walked over to this tree and he fondled the leaves of the tree. And then he went on with the supervisor. And when he got to the door, his wife met him at the door and his face just broke out in a smile. He was just real proud. And he turned around and asked his supervisor, he said, would you like to have supper with me and my family? And the supervisor was curious enough about him and his family until he told him, yes, he'd like to. So he went in and said the employee just become talkative and real happy, whereas at work he had just stayed to himself and never talked or anything. The supervisor just really enjoyed the supper. So when it got time for him to leave, the employee walked outside with his supervisor, and the supervisor told him he'd enjoyed the supper and all that, and he asked him, he said, I've got a personal question I want to ask you. Do you mind? And the man said, no. And he said, I noticed when we drove up, you walked up to this tree and fondled the leaves. said, what were you doing? And he said, well, it's not right to bring my problems from work home to my family. So every day when I pull up in the yard, I go leave my troubles out here in the tree because I'm going to come right by it the next morning and pick them up. And I found out the tree will keep them for me, but they're so much smaller the next day when I come back to get them. And he said, I do the same thing with my home life, whatever, you know, if there's a problem. So learn to do that. And I told that one time in class, and I, I didn't realize how true this, what the student was saying was. She said, there's not enough trees in the forest. <laughs> and I can, assure, I can assure you before she graduated, I realized she was telling the truth. <laughs> we keep several bushes right out here, so it's best to just leave that sort of thing. And that doesn't mean you're not going to come in and say it's my baby's second birthday or something. That's happy things. But for the most part, leave your personal life at home. So have your personal file cabinet before leaving school. And what did I tell you all the very first day? I don't send things home with you. There's a reason for that. What is that reason? See, I don't want you taking this home to your family either. It's all right for you to talk to them and tell them, you know, you enjoyed so-and-so or what you learned today or you didn't make as good on a test as you wanted to. But if you've had a really bad day, it's not but good for you to go dump that on them at the end of the day any more than it is, you know, for you to come in here and dump on us. So compartmentalization is storing things away in the different compartment of the mind, and it works. Keep your energy up, and you do that by getting plenty of rest, eating right, exercising, and doing things for yourself. Respect others. And the first part of respecting others is what? Respect yourself first. If you respect you, you will not be rude and ugly to other people. You will not be talking really bad about other people. Stay productive. Have you ever noticed if you get up in the mornings and you just make it to the table and then make it back to the couch to watch TV the rest of the day, that's about all you're going to do? Yeah. If you get up and you start working, what do you do? You'll go ahead and do everything you need to do all day. We're all like that. So staying productive. There are three habits that can keep you from maintaining peak performance. Procrastination, perfectionism, and the lack of a game plan. And we're going to talk about procrastination. It is so easy when there's a task we don't like. And as you go through this, you're going to find a lot of things you like, but you're going to find a lot of things you don't like to do in cosmetology. And the things you don't like to do, you put off. Some of you are not going to like to take tests. Some of you are not going to like finger waves or whatever. And you leave it to the last thing. You put it off, and you put it off, and you put it off. The instructors are coming by getting on to you about it. You've got to do so and so. So you get irritated with the instructors. So you're a little bit miffed with them. If you had went ahead and done it instead of putting it off, it would be behind you. But as long as it's ahead of you and you're still putting it off, it's biting at you all the time. You ever notice that about something you know you got to do and yet you... Procrastinate, so don't leave it aside. Procrastination is putting off until tomorrow what you can do today. This dangerous but widespread habit robs you of self-esteem. It also makes you feel guilty when it's laying there for you to do and you go off and have some fun. It's back there all the time you're having that fun. And you could really have some free fun if you had just taken the time to do it. Perfectionism is a compulsion to do things perfectly. It's unhealthy. Success is not always simply a matter of always doing things right. We all make mistakes. We never do everything right every time. I have also found that some people use perfectionism is 
as a way to get out of doing something. Well, I can't do it like I want it done, so I'm not going to do it. That's a cop-out. I'm sorry, that's a cop-out. For all of you that think you're perfectionist, when we start doing work, you're going to find out that perfectionism is way out there and somewhere else. I cannot do all of the work in cosmetology perfect, and I'm not going to stand here and tell you I can. Nor do I desire to do it because I believe that would drive me wild. And even Mother Nature does not make things perfectly. Look at us. You know, Look at the leaves on the trees, the flowers. There's always a little something there that's not perfect. Next thing you need to do is invest in yourself by coming up with a game plan, which is the conscious act, conscious act of planning your life instead of just letting things happen. Right now, you've already done a little planning. You planned, planned to start the school, didn't you? And now you've got to learn to organize your days every day in order to keep things moving smoothly in class. One of my favorite sayings is, and, and again, my youngest son, he laughs at me about this one, if you can't keep up, how are you going to catch up? You know, so have that game plan to do it as we do it. Because it is very difficult once you get behind with anything to catch up. The next thing we've got to have is motivation and self-management. Where does motivation come from? What motivated you to come to school? Your interest, Your interest in it? You wanted to? What else? Do you want a little better job? Future. Your future. All of those things are motivating, aren't they? Motivation is the ignition for success. Self-management is the fuel that will keep you going. While motivation propels you to do something and can come from inside you in a way that is very instinctive, self-management is a well-thought-out process for the long term. When you're hungry, you're motivated to eat. But management is what helps you to decide what you will do to get that food. And the same thing is here. When you lose your motivation, you need to start working on yourself and become motivated again. All of us get in ruts and bogged down, and there's going to be points in time you wonder if you really want to do cosmetology because we're in something you don't really like and something may be going on at home. But you've got to keep your motivation up. Another thing we have to do for success is to satisfy our basic human needs, and all of us do have those. And the first one is physical. Food, rest, exercise, enjoyment. We also need emotional needs. We want to feel good about ourselves. And I have a poem that I'll hand out to y'all, the one in the mirror. And oftentimes we worry about what other people think of us. And it is nice to be liked. And it is nice for people to want to be around us and all that. But the person that it should matter to you most, what you think about yourself, is the one in the mirror. Who is that? It's you. Social. We're not meant to be isolated animals. We like to live in a social world. We like to have relationships with families and friends. So we have to do things socially, and we should have some time every day or every week. Mental is another basic need. People want to do good work. We want to use our brains and our abilities to contribute to the world. And we want feedback that we're doing just that. And sometimes us instructors don't come along often enough and tell you you're doing good because there's so many students down here. But you can look at your test and tell, and I try to, that's one of the things I try to work on is my goal is to be more complimentary to students as they do things. I am not a big-time complimentary person, and when I come by and compliment you on something, does that mean you've done something good or I'm trying to make you feel good? It means you deserve that compliment. We had um, somebody that started working here at night one time, and every time I'd walk in the office, she'd say, Oh, you look so good tonight. You wear the prettiest clothes, and that was every time I walked in the office, it made me feel real good until one night I was in the copy room. And somebody else walked in, and she told them the same thing. Before I could get through copying, there was another one come in. She told them the same thing. 
You understand what I'm saying? So all of those compliments become meaningless to me. So keep that in mind as you compliment people. When they deserve a compliment, give it to them and give it to them freely. But don't just hand out compliments because you might think it makes them feel good because after a while, they're going to figure out that you're just running around complimenting everybody on anything, whether it's good or not. Spiritual. Most people are able to address this final need only when they have experienced a sense of satisfaction about the other four. The spiritual need is the feeling that there is a higher truth, a pattern that gives life meaning. Next thing we're going to do is assess our creative capabilities. How many of y'all are creative? Very good. Do y'all know usually I get very few hands when I ask that question? So I got like a 40% that time. What's wrong with the rest of you? Y'all not creative? Well, you're fixing to be because we're going to assess your creative capabilities. And we're going to show you what your creative abilities are. All of you are creative, I can assure you, in different ways. But everybody has some creative capabilities. One of the first things to do is we'll get together and start brainstorming on things to do, like when we do our project, a display for products for a service. And you're going to be surprised at what's in there. We're just going to have to drag it out. Creativity means having a talent like painting or acting or having a way with hair. It's also an unlimited inner resource of ideas and solutions for many challenges we face in life. It's not just for genuses, gen, genuses well, I can't even say it, like Beethoven, Michelangelo, or Walt Disney. Creativity is available to the average individual who can look inward to find new ways of thinking and problem solving. To enhance the skill of creativity, keep these guidelines in mind. Stop criticizing yourself. Criticism blocks that creativity. And saying you're not creative is one of the ways that you are holding up your creativity. Stop asking others what to do. Oftentimes we want others to make our decision so when something goes wrong we can say, well, I would have done so and so. You know, but they, but if you hadn't asked them, most people wouldn't have given you their opinion to start with. Change your vocabulary. Build a positive vocabulary of active, active problem-solving words like explore, analyze, determine, judge, assess, and so on. And do not try to go it alone. You can't even come to school alone. You've got to have some support at home, haven't you? How many of you have children? Then you've got to have a spouse or parents or friends that's going to help you. There's going to be times those children are going to be sick or whatever. So don't try to go anything alone. Being creative does not mean doing everything alone. The best self-managers ask for help. Now, managing our career. One of the first things we want to do to make a good management of our career is to design a mission statement. Why do we need a mission statement? To set forth your values. Set forth your values. Set forth your goals. Is that what the book said? The school has a mission statement. It's posted on the walls here for y'all to say. What if we didn't have a mission here at the college? we just kind of flounder around doing most anything, wouldn't we? What do you think our mission is? To provide education to our students. World class. Seamless. A lot of education. I am going to ask you to write a mission statement. It will be on this test I give you or the final or whatever. And the book gave us an example. I am committed to being the best I can be. It gives us something to shoot for that we want to do. This is our mission in life. Every successful business has a business plan. An essential part of this plan is the mission statement that sets forth the values the business plans to live by and that helps establish 
future goals. Then we go into goal setting, and I'm not going to bog down a lot in goal setting because y'all are going to be taking imp 100 and they go into it. But I want to give you a couple of pointers about goal setting. First off, you need a goal. You need short-term goals and you need long-term goals. And today, if I were you, my short-term goal would be pass this test. And today, my long-term goal would be to pass cosmetology, to graduate from cosmetology. What you don't want to do is set a goal that you cannot achieve. Don't set a goal that two years from now you're going to be a state board examiner. You're not going to achieve that. You're setting yourself up for failure. So always make sure that your goals are achievable. And what do you do if you don't succeed one day with one of your goals? Quit. Try again. You get up and try again. And keep that goal. One of the first things in helping us with goals is time management. We have got to learn to prioritize. How many of you just want to do what you want to do? <laughs> yeah, I've seen hands go up all over the place. All of us want to, but life doesn't quite work that way, does it? And now we've set off on some other endeavor, and you've added school to whatever else you've been doing. Now you got school and all your other responsibilities. And I've already told you, you need to spend time doing things you enjoy. So what, the first thing we've got to do in time management is learn to prioritize by making a list of tasks that need to be done in the order of most important to least important. When you design your own time management system, make sure it works for you. So your time management system can't be the same thing as mine. If you are a person who needs a fair amount of flexibility, schedule in some blocks of times that aren't structured. Then stress is counterproductive to time management. Stress eats up time. We are going to study stress a little later on, but first off I want to ask you, what is it that, how many of y'all do get stressed? What makes you stressed? Being overloaded? Why are you overloaded? Because you didn't prioritize. Let me tell you one of the major things that stresses me. I come into work about 15 or 20 minutes before I have to be at work. Because if I run in here right on the dot, I've started my day off under stress because I feel like I'm running all day instead of going through my task as I should. And I notice that that stresses other people. Then if I leave home late and thinking I'm going to get here right on the minute, what happens? I get behind somebody that took their car for a walk. <laughs> I promise you. You ever have that happen? Well, then I get a little more stressed. I'm already stressed because I left the house late. Now I've got behind Sam who only drives eight miles an hour. And I've got to follow him half the way to work. So I'm getting running a little later and a little later and what's my stress level doing? Then I get to the four-way stop and the one that got there right after me turns out in front of me. So I'm a little later and now I'm about mad with him too. So by now I'm, I'm almost to the boiling point. And why? Whose fault was it? It was mine. Had I went ahead and started out earlier, it wouldn't have bothered me that somebody drove eight miles an hour in front of me. It wouldn't have bothered me that somebody pulled out in front of me. I could have still come on to work and been here a few minutes earlier. I like to come in, unlock the department, do my little things. At 10 minutes date, I'll walk back out, and I'll like have a little wind-down time so that when you come here... How many of you in the morning have come in and felt like I was stressed? I'm ready for you. And I'm ready to get to work with you. So you create a lot of your own stress. We say we don't. Now, other things add to it. I'm not saying, I didn't say you created all of it, but you create a good deal of it. Never take on more than you can handle. Learn to say no, and that's something I have a problem with. Because everybody needs help with something. And some of us seem to be the patsies. But now that you're in school and you have a family and a home and all this, 
You're going to have to sometime let them do the things they should be doing. And I had a student tell a story one day when I was in this, and she said that um, there was a student in the class with her. She had went her first couple of quarters she had taken at another school and said she felt so sorry for this girl because she seemed to be so far behind all the time, and she had a small child, and she thought that was why. So they were to have a um, kit check one morning. And she knew the girl didn't have hers ready or anything, so she told her, said, I'll take it home and, and get it ready. When I get mine ready, I'll just check off your list and pack it now when I pack mine. So she said she was missing something in the girl's kit, so she called to ask her, did she have it? And she said, what y'all doing? Said, oh, we were having a party tonight. So she could hear music in the background and all that, and so here's somebody else doing her work for her because she seemed to be piled up would work all the time and that's not always the case sometimes people genuinely need some help but maybe you need to do something for yourself or your uh, obligations more learn problem solving techniques that will save you time by uncovering solutions give yourself a time out whenever you're frustrated overwhelmed irritated worried or feeling guilty about something Carry some cards or a memo pad with you. Sometime a great ideal strikes. And if we don't write it down, we can't remember it. And we may not remember it for two months. We may not ever remember it. Make schedules, daily, weekly, and monthly. And remember that they can be changed. You did not chisel them in stone. You wrote them on paper. And that's one of the hardest things for me to realize. If I'm going to write something down that it occurs at this time, I want it occurring right then. You know, I, I sometimes don't get flexible with that. And we all need to be able to flexible. Even my supervisor would tell me, it's a plan. You know, plan means that's what we plan to do. It doesn't say that we must um, complete it or we're going to be beheaded or something. It's a plan. Identify the times of day when you're highly energetic. So put your work during those hours of the day. Reward yourself with a special treat when you do work well and your time is managed efficiently. Do not neglect physical activity. Schedule at least one block of free time a day for yourself. Understand the value of to-do lists for the day or week. And it makes us feel so good if we've got that list because as we accomplish something, we check it off. That's over and done with. And we feel really good about it. Make time management a habit. Then study skills, and again, I'm not going to bog down in it because you're going to go into it in Int 100. But I will go ahead and tell you, a lot of people think when they get in cosmetology that we learn how to roll up a little bit of hair and cut a little bit of hair, and that's it. We do some intensive studying. Some of you had good hab study habits in school. Some of you didn't. But you need to set forth a time and a place to do your studying. You need to also understand what kind of learner you are. So we're going to go over the types of learners. And once you understand what kind of learner you are, it makes it easier for you to learn efficiently. An interactive learner, also known as imaginative learners, do best when they can ask why. They watch, they listen, they share ideas. They appreciate the instructors who involve them in the experience. You may be the reader-listener learner. These individuals, also called analytical learners, ask what. They learn best by reading and hearing new ideas and mulling over the information. So they got to take time to think about it. The systematic learners also called common sense learners sit down to study. They get more out of the information when they can connect what they are studying to real life situations. They ask how. Intuitive learners, also known as dynamic learners, ask what if. They like to learn through trial and error. When they are studying, they actually want to try out what they are reading about. They appreciate instructors who understand their need to be stimulated with new ideas. And then we set our good study skills or 
habits. Start out by estimating how many hours you need to. And I told you all this during orientation. Some of us need to study more than others. Don't feel bad about that. If you want it, you'll spend the extra time doing it. Study when you feel energetic and motivated. Find odd downtimes to study. Select a quiet location. Study sitting in a chair instead of laying down. Maintain a routine by studying in the same place. Ethics. Ethics are the principles of good character, proper conduct, moral judgment expressed through personality, human relations, skills, and professional image. So ethics are the moral principles by which we live and work. Were we all brought up with somewhat different ethics? Yeah. Somewhat different ethics. Some things were more important in some of our homes than it was in others. But should we all have the basic same code of ethics? Honesty, all that sort of thing. Yes, we should. And do you know most professions sets forth the code of ethics, and so does cosmetology. What are some of those ethics? What are some of the characteristics we want to develop in dealing with our customers and co-workers? Integrity. What? Integrity. Integrity. What else? Honesty. Compassion. Compassion. Caring about the other person. Attentiveness. One of the major complaints that clients have now is, I like the way she done my hair, but I am tired of sitting there in the chair and her working on me and talking on the phone to one of her friends. I'm sick of it. She doesn't pay me a bit of attention. You ever felt that way in the salon? What about punctuality? I'm tired of getting there at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's when my appointment is, and she gets there at 8.30, and then I've got to wait on her to set up everything, get everything ready. Cooperativeness. Pleasant and agreeable personality. So various characteristics, principles, and values contribute to the development of a high standard of professionalism. It can be a challenge keep these ethics in place year after year. What could kind of make us lose some of our ethics? What can make us lose some of our ethics? The answer is not in the book. Losing interest. Losing interest. Difficult individuals that we deal with seem like we can never please them. Stress in our life. Communication. Why is communication... Not what? Being not organized. Not organized. What does communication have to do with our ethics, with our clients? Understanding. Understanding the client. Listening to what the client said she wanted. That is another major complaint they have. She never listens to what I tell her. Men are also bad about that too. They don't listen either. They hear, but they don't listen. Y'all ever complain about that? Oh, yeah. All right, as we go into ethics, we also want to go into personality development and attitude. How many of you already have your personality developed? We want to say yes because that seems like well, that's what I'm looking for, isn't it? <clears throat> I love you do have your personality development developed, but are you willing to change it some? Hope so, because you're going to have to change it with every client you have. One of them likes the little jokes you tell. The next one likes you to shut up. <laughs> so you've got to change how you act from client to client. Your personality defines who you are. It's the way you walk and talk, the way you hold your head. Your personality is the sum total of who you are, and it is what distinguishes you from other people. You can get an idea of the nature of inborn personality characteristics by watching newborn babies. Some of them are real calm. Some of them are laying there crying. 
So we're born with some personality, but we have to work on a lot of our traits, don't we? What is the difference in personality and attitude? Yeah, you sure can. Attitude is defined as one's outlook. <clears throat> Personality is who we are, outlook. Why do some people have such a horrible attitude? They don't like their self. Like Who said that? That's exactly right. They don't like themselves, therefore they're not going to like you either. Me neither. And they run around with that chip on their shoulder all the time trying to convince you that the world's against them and now they want the, you to think the world's against you. And they will give you a bad attitude and give you a bad outlook on life. So attitude stems from what we believe and it can be influenced by our parents, teachers, friends, and even books and movies. We may not be able to change a characteristic with which we were born, but we can change our attitude. We can tell a person's attitude by what they think, by their emotions, and by what they do. So we want to make sure we keep a positive attitude all the time. You only have to do your best in business and in your personal life. A pleasing attitude gains more associates, more clients, and more friends. Refer often to the following ingredients of a healthy, well-developed attitude to see if they match your recipe. Diplomacy. Being assertive is a good thing. It helps people know where you are coming from. It is, however, a short step from behaving aggressively or even bullying. So make sure you don't step over the line. Your tone of voice. And I worked in a salon, and this is a story I have to tell every time I go over this, too. I worked in a salon. And naturally, whoever gets to the telephone, it might be a new customer on that telephone. And if you get there first, they book with you. So it's a mad race to the telephone when it rings. And I will never re never forget this hairdresser that I work with. She'd grab up that phone, beauty shop. <laughs> what would you have done had you been the caller? I'd have hung up. You will go on the desk and work the desk for 50 hours here. You are to answer the telephone. Cosmetology department, Miss Brows will speaking. How may I help you or may I help you with something? And you are to do it with a smile. They can hear your smile on the other end of the phone. Do you believe that? They absolutely can hear you smile. So make sure your tone of voice is really good. Speak clearly. You also need emotional stability. Our emotional life is important. It is essential to have feelings and as express them appropriately. But some people have no control over their feelings. All of us, I think, maybe lose control on occasion, but in business you can't afford to. When they are happy, they get almost frantic, and when they are angry, they fly into a rage. This makes people uncomfortable, and they're not going to want to be in your beauty salon. Even if they're coming to one of your other hairdressers, they're going to soon get out of there. So make sure you have emotional stability. Sensitivity. Our personality shines the most when you show concern for the feelings of others. And it seems like every year we get more and more into the society of, I want this, I want that. We'll even do that with our clients. I wanted her hair like this because it looks better on her. What's wrong with that concept? Maybe it really does look better on her. It may not make her happy. And whose dollar was it? <laughs> values and goals. Neither our values nor our goals are inborn characteristics. We acquire these as we move for li through life. It is important, however, that we acquire them. Without values and uh, goals, we're not going to be successful. Receptivity. We've got to be receptive to suggestions from other people and also learning from other people. And we may look at a person in our class that always just makes 75 on each test and you're making a whole lot better, but believe me, you can learn from that person. 
I learn from students every quarter. And sometimes I get the feeling that I learn more than the students do, which makes me step back and look at what I'm teaching. Communication skills. A person with a warm, caring personality has an easy time talking about themselves and listening to what others have to say. When such a person wants something, they ask for it clearly and directly. Now our human relations, which is what we've been leading up to. And one of the major things we've got to focus on is that we do not have to like everybody. But if we're going to be in the same environment, we do have to get along with everybody. For whatever reason, we just find some people harder to get along with. What happens if you're in here and somebody that you're having a hard time getting along with? What do you need to do? Right. Let's swap y'all out. You don't have to be in the uh, close-knit vicinity. It's not possible to always understand what people need, even when you know them well. If you do think you understand what people want, you cannot always be sure that you will satisfy them. So we've come up to tension and misunderstanding. The ability to understand people is the key to operating efficiently in many professions. But to understand others... The best way to start is with a firm understanding of yourself. How many of you really understand yourself? What makes you tick? What buttons are pushed that set you off? And if you understand that, then you are going to be able to understand them a lot better. A fundamental factor in human relations has to do with how secure we feel. And most people that have the bad attitudes and do not get along well do not feel good about themselves. So that's why we've talked a while ago about you must respect yourself and you must care about yourself. Respond instead of reacting. And that's sometimes a hard time, hard thing to do. But what is the difference in responding and reacting? That's responding, isn't it? Reacting is going ahead and saying something and taking the chance of hurting them, hurting their feelings or making them angry. And this mostly applies the respond instead of reacting is flying off at somebody about something they said. If we will stop and listen and think about what they said, it may not be as bad as it struck us at to start with. So we think before we respond. We react before we think. And doing something without thinking verges on being dangerous. Believe in yourself always. Talk less, listen more. And they used to tell us when we were children, that's why you got two ears and one mouth. (laughs) You should do twice as much listening as you do talking, and that's not a bad idea. We learn a whole lot more when we're listening than we do when we're talking, aren't we? Be attentive. This goes back to the client that complains because you talked on the telephone the whole time you worked on her. What is she paying you for? We know we charge her $50 for that perm. And we didn't pay but 3 or 4 or $5 for it. So what is she paying us the $50 for? Our attention. Our attention. That's exactly right. Take your own temperature. If you're getting aggravated with a client, is it necessarily her doing something wrong or you've got a short fuse sometime? Well, you want to take your temperature and see. Your clients may pick up on negative feelings too. And it's hard when you've just had a client to give you a difficult time not to let it carry over to the next client. But if you let it carry over to the next one, and maybe you're not being snappish or anything, maybe you're just being real quiet and and not paying her a whole lot of attention. But she may think she's done something wrong. We have the golden rules of human relations. Keep these in mind always. Communicate from your heart, problem solve from your head. A smile is worth a million times more than a sneer. And I always tell my students, this, this is just one of my little sayings, You know, they say spread sunshine. 
That's when you spread in sun, sunshine, you'll get it on yourself. If you spread crap, guess where some of it winds up to? <laughs> so think of that every time you start spreading it around. You cannot spread it to everybody else without winding up with it on you. It's easy to make an enemy. It's harder to keep a friend. See what happens when you ask for help instead of just reacting. Show people you care by listening to them and try to understand their point of view. Tell people how great they are even when they are not acting so great. And those of y'all that have children know all along if you're on to them about something, they'll say, you don't love me. You know, you heard that one? The best thing to tell them is, yes, I will always love you. I may not like you too much right now because of the way you act. And, you know, but tell people how great they are. Sometimes it'll keep them from acting so badly. Being right is different from acting righteous. For every service you do for others, do something for you. Laugh often. Show patience with other people's flaws. Build shared goals. Be a team player and a partner to your clients. And always remember that listening is the best relationship builder. Do we have questions? Did y'all learn anything? Well, I'm a little surprised because most of us learned that way back, but maybe it helped you with a little understanding. The what? Just refreshes. It refreshes your memory. It's nice to go. It's nice to be reminded occasionally, isn't it? All righty.